Okay, so now we are recording. Well, I want to welcome everybody to our call. This is the network of North American coaching supervisors. Great to see all of your beautiful faces. Um, with Lily and, and Lynn Delay, we started organizing these uh, activities, Tatiana, for a few months now, almost, I don't know how many, six months maybe. And the idea is every month we have a coach supervisor uh, who's an expert who can bring some experience about how to build the practice of a coach supervisor to bring awareness about how coaching supervision started in other parts of the world. So in North America and Latin America, because we have here people from all, all Americas, uh, can learn and can apply some of this learning in the work that we do. So we're very lucky today to have Tatiana Vashkirova with us. Tatiana, I can say I'm very proud to say she's my supervisor. And we have been working together for a couple of years. And I met Tatiana at a conference in San Diego a couple of years ago from the uh, American Psychological Association Chapter 13, the Coaching Consulting uh, Division, where she was the keynote speaker. And Tatiana, she uh, wrote a, a few books. Some of you already use the books, and most of you, I think, use her books for, for our coaching supervision training. Uh, and she is a professor of coaching psychology and director of the International Center for Coaching and Mentoring Studies at Oxford Brooks University in the UK. And her area of expertise is developmental coaching and coaching supervision. Uh, she has a book, coaching super, uh, Developmental Coaching, that uh, most of you have heard about it. Uh, personally, Tatiana, after I, I learned about this model, I use it a lot to work with, uh, co with my clients as a coach and also in coaching supervision because uh, till recently we treat our clients like we were all coming from the same place and by understanding that there are different stages of self-development, we can relate to them and work with them differently. So I think that is a great contribution to the coaching profession. Uh, she's a recognized author, international speaker, and convener and chair of the International Conference on Coaching Supervision. So she's the leader of the Coaching Supervision Conference that happens every year in Oxford Brooks. Uh, Lily has been attending that. So I know she's been there a couple of times. And um, it will be good for people to be more familiar with that opportunity next year. And she leads a program uh, of advanced studies in coaching supervision and is a member of the Scientific Advisor Council in the, at the Institute of Coaching at Harvard. So this is who, and there is much more to say about Tatiana, but uh, I am here today to tell us, to share with us some key elements of her model of developmental coaching and how that's applied to coaching supervision. I believe that Tatiana is one of the leaders of coaching supervision worldwide. So we're very lucky to have um, her with us today. And then let's open to a discussion and a conversation. So I promise her that she will not have to lecture for us uh, I, I invite her to talk with us only for a few minutes, maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then have a dialogue and a conversation. So I want to invite everyone to be prepared to come up with some questions after 15 or 20 minutes. And, and Tatiana, I think what can be nice too, if we have everyone just to say your name and where you're from, so Tatiana get a sense of who we are here in, in this uh, meeting today. We need to go really fast because we don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I do believe it's also a good opportunity for everybody to get to know each other and also build a network of coaching supervisors in the Americas. So Eva, Eva do you want to go ahead and let's go really fast? And let's say our name and where are we calling from? Hello, everyone. Especially hello to you, Tatiana. I'm Eva from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Hello, Eva. <laughs> According to my window, Terry, do you want to go next? So we'll let, let's go. Oh, Terry Hildebrand from Denver, Colorado. Hi, Tatiana. Adriana Rodriguez from Mexico City. Okay. Amanda, you want to go next? You're me. Okay. Hi, Tatiana. This is Amanda Carruthers. I'm from Denver, Colorado. Hello. Teresa? Hi. Um, I am Teresa Estremadoiro from uh, Lima, Peru. Mary Jo. Mary Jo Asmus from the well-known Kalamazoo, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Jason Sackett. I'm from Los Angeles, California. My neighbor, Michelle. 
Hi, I'm Michelle, and I'm from Golden, British Columbia, Canada. Lillian, do you want to go next? Had to unmute myself, sorry. I'm Lillian Abrams, and while I'm tempted to say I'm from Los Angeles, because I really am, I'm actually located right now in New Jersey, just outside New York City. Hi. And Sam? Hello, Tatiana. Oh, hi, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> we know each other. Yes, we know each other. Seattle, Washington. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Lily also knows Tatiana. Lily, my co-host. Uh, do you wanna? Hi, Tatiana. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too, Lily, again. <laughs> and I know there are a couple of people who are not. They don't have the camera on, like Nancy. Nancy, do you want to introduce yourself? Good morning. This is Nancy Tillim calling from Los Angeles. Thank you for having us, Tatiana. Oh, see, so Tatiana, I think Los Angeles we are majority here in this call. After so we got three people. It's great to see that we have people from all over the world here, all, all over Latin America. I mean, America. Sorry. So Tatiana, just is the space for you. If you wanna go ahead and start sharing some of your slides, and let's plan to have twenty minutes, thirty minutes uh, mm -hmm. conversation, and then let's open to everybody to have a dialogue with you. Okay, great. And, um, hello, everyone, and so nice to hear that, that you are all from all these warm places. But I have to say, I actually can compete with you this time because we have 30 degrees, like in Rome, in, in Oxford here. And that's why kind of it's very rare when I use no sleeves <laughs> on this call. Okay, it's so lovely. Um, that you're interested in this presentation and what I wanted us to discuss today is a developmental function of supervision, which is nothing new, but I hope we can look at it from this angle and then I will uh, share a little bit about the, um, the theory that I was developing for coaching but then adapted for supervision uh, in terms of the developmental stages of we are going through. So I'm traveled, trying to share the screen right now, and I hope it will work. Okay, and right. Okay, has everyone seen it now? Shall I make it a whole full, or is it okay like that? It's up to you. If you want to press the button to show like a whole presentation, you can do that, or you can leave it like this. Yeah, let's leave it like that, because uh, if everyone is happy like that, then uh, it will be easy for me, because then I uh, change in the slides. Okay. Right, okay, so in order to start, I will um, show, just remind you the functions of situation. And um, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, if at any point, people ask questions, I would be happy to do it in a conversation, even as we go. Is it okay, Damien? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. So, if you feel like um, interrupting, just uh, feel comfortable as you wish, and we can discuss it as we go. So, what was my intention for this conversation? It, first of all, just to explore a little bit more the function, the developmental function of supervision in comparison to others. Because very often people, interestingly enough, underestimate, in my view, the most important function. Uh, then we will discuss what supervisors can do to influence developmental process of coaching. And then just consider in what way developmental theories can be used in our supervision practice. Okay, that's my plan, but I'm happy to sort of to deviate if you feel that it would be useful. So this is just simply for reminding, okay, because everyone start talking about supervision, uh, thinking about main functions, and they always have some variation in terms of name, and if you can see the proctor started from normative, formative, restorative function of supervision, but um, Kadushin used it normative, like administrative, managerial, uh, formative as educational, and then restorative as supportive. And that is historically how it, uh, they were named. 
And if we look at more close to the supervision in coaching that Hawkins and Smith uh, also introduced this function as qualitative developmental and resourcing. So we can say that actually Hawkins is the first named that function that I want us to talk today as developmental. And um, we in Brooks just slightly made uh, variation to this names, we still want to keep normative as normative, which is ensuring the work is professional and ethical. And developmental or formative is facilitating personal and professional development of the coach, and restorative is providing emotional support. So that's what, how we use it in our programs. So, and that's what I uh, just uh, simply to remind you this function. But let's now just check with you, okay? The question is, if we, um, and this is very often people just ask what the supervision is for in as a main function. So what I would like you to think uh, is, where, what do you think the main weight of supervision? Is it to ensure the quality of coaching or to enhance the development of coaches? I, I don't uh, sort of introduce anything like a um, sort of to check your answers, but... Um, I would say it's, it's for both. Um, right. I think, you know, both would mm -hmm. be benefits. Okay, thanks, Terry. Um, but, but if I pressed you and said, but what is, which one is more important? <laughs> Depends on the client, I would say. Some clients would want more quality and others want development. So I think it, would, it really depends on what they want. And I'll just say, I would also see this as, in a sense, kind of sequential, that if you enhance the development of coaches, you have enhanced the quality of coaching. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, thanks Lillian too. Um, what I'm going to make a case okay, is um, uh, on uh, exactly on the more importance of development of coaches and why you, I will tell you in a minute, but actually I was accused sometimes uh, for enhancing, sort of to make more emphasis on the development of coaches because they said uh, if we, uh, and, undermine the sort of the left column they ensure the quality of coaching so we are more or less undermine the whole meaning of supervision uh, and wouldn't be able to sell it hard if you see what I mean but let me explain why I believe that um, it's a, exactly more or less in the sequence as Len suggests okay. um, because um, even if we believe that the main uh, idea behind supervision is improve the quality of coaching, that, that column. Um, what um, it obviously implies that we have some notion of what is good and what is not good. Okay. And this is not that simple because, um, the, for example, if I will ask you, who is in the best position to say that it's a good social, uh, coaching session, or not good, uh, good coaching session. For example, is it a coach in the best position to say it? Is it a client? Or, or is it a number of observers, the group of observers? What do you think? I would say the client because uh, it's the client who make the insights and who see the learning in himself or herself. Right, okay. And I would say all of them have a point of view and the, the number of observers is more than normative. The, are you, you know, mm -hmm. the people who have an emotional stake in the situation may not be best suited to evaluate mm -hmm. all the ethics and conflicts of interest and whatever else. So having mm -hmm. a, quasi objective whatever that means but somewhat objective reference reference point outside yourself they mm -hmm. also are a valid stakeholder mm -hmm. okay and I, uh, ideally of course in ideal case scenario it's 
all of them is a good answer because yes of course we uh, if, if client should be happy coach could see this session if it is a good session and observer should confirm it but I of course you guess that I'm not going to leave it like that so uh, and, <laughs> and I will offer you a challenge what if there is a disagreement between them so what if there is a discrepancy so uh, and I will actually I want to share a little bit of research here um, that uh, was done by the by my colleague Adrian Mayes in and it was his doctorate and um, so I will explain what he actually did because it would be very useful and quite a few questions come from that um, position uh, so from this research because what he did he looked at clients um, at pairs okay, where the client and the coach had a one-off session and he recorded that session and he asked about uh, each of, uh, client and um, asked what how the session looked like and he also used an instrument a particular instrument that uh, could describe kind of the all element of that session uh, he also uh, and that was six sessions like that with the pairs uh, separate pairs um, and then he asked a group of observers also coaches uh, in each group there was about five six coaches who watched that um, video of the session and were asked also to describe first of all what stands out for them from those sessions and also to uh, use the same instrument and uh, we apply um, sort of the same uh, to try to really evaluate each element of the session and you obviously guess now what I'm going to say because what was interesting uh, as a result of this project uh, that clients uh, were kind of invariably happy with the sessions. Uh, coaches also could see that the, there was some learning was happening from uh, uh, the clients were happy so as clients were happy, coaches were also reasonably satisfied because they can they consent with learning. Uh, but what has happened with observer sessions, uh, they were incredibly critical about everything uh, what um, they observed in the sessions. And in some cases, in a very severe way. So, um, what it's actually raises that sometimes uh, the questions it creates is uh, for us so it, it actually creates lots of questions so how we can, who is the most valuable person to say whether it's a good or bad okay uh, that's the one thing but in relation to what we are discussing today uh, the, the main question is on your screen so if coaches cannot observe all their mistakes uh, how would we be able to identify them for discussions in the supervision session? Do, do, do you understand how huge this dilemma is? Absolutely. Okay. Right, so, and that's what where I'm going now with, okay? Um, because um, Adrian, um, as a result of his project, he actually was arguing uh, the case that um, it's possible that client and coach actually create some sort of the meaning between themselves. And that meaning and that uh, quality of work may not be actually easily observable by the observers. Okay? That's what his point is. And... Um, but we also can take the same things, um, sorry, I skipped it. Uh, we also can say that coaching supervision possibly is a highly subjective co-creation of meaning between the coach and the supervisor. So if it is the case, and if coaching is also the case like that, then what happens that the normative function, in my view, simply collapses into developmental. Because um, 
if coach coach who brings the case for supervision can uh, only they only can bring something what they can identify as something to work with but the problem is um, what is then left for supervision uh, for the supervisors uh, is to um, for example, improve their quality of perception. So to make sure that they uh, don't self-deceive themselves. Okay? Uh, and for that reason, they would be able to see more in those sessions than um, uh, observers potentially might be able to see. Also, um, you probably, of course, know all this expression, wonderful expression from Kafka, that we see things not as they are, but as we are. And uh, for that reason, if we are developing, then we are actually able to see more. And also, um, um, what we could do developmentally is maximizing the number of perspectives that the coach can take on their practice. And that was even Wilbur mentioned that sometimes development can be measured by the number of perspectives that we can take on things. Tatiana, just, just one comment about that is that uh, I, I have been encouraging people to listen to their uh, supervision and to their coaching. And yeah. when coaches listen to their coaching with supervisors, listen to their supervising, they may bring different levels of perception. But as you are saying, that does not mean that they still can be blind to some mm -hmm. things that they don't see that coming up. But at least it's a one step towards that direction. But uh, I found that sometimes it's an issue of time, but sometimes there is resistance mm -hmm. for people to listen to themselves, to learn mm -hmm. about themselves. What, what, what do you think about that? I absolutely agree. And I can see that uh, it, it's not necessarily because we want in supervision just to touch the coaches when we observe their sessions, um, but um, it's just another perspective. And then we can work with that because something is uh, the coaches just simply might not be to see and might not be able to bring for supervision. And that happens, even with very, very experienced coaches. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't happen that often. And for the reason that you mentioned sometimes, because it takes time, it makes the sessions more longer, more expensive. So there are reasons for that. But um, I, I just still believe that it, it is, I absolutely agree, it is an important addition to our supervisory work. Yeah. May I add something, Tatiana and Sam? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm intrigued by your use of Kafka and Wilbur. So right. these, these are people who are not known as coaching experts. And what's parallel for me is that you've gone outside of coaching to add an additional perspective. And in a way that's parallel to the purpose of supervision to get a third entity outside of the coaching events that occur between the coach and the client. And that outside perspective allows us to see things that we're, when we're embedded in the coaching, we can't see. And perhaps this is why the observers in the research were so critical because they're embedded in coaching and they're judging from within coaching rather than getting a meta perspective. But uh, thank you, Sam. And I actually think uh, we—I didn't sort of explain the further research of um, uh, those. Uh, what what are the reasons for those coaches to be so critical about the sessions? And uh, there are good reasons, and some of them I absolutely agree with you because they were obviously looking at the session from the perspective they were embedded in. So, for example, you can imagine if, uh, sort of cognitive behavioral coaches were watching a uh, gestalt type of coach working, so, or NLP coach uh, where uh, watching the person-centered coach, they were incredibly critical because they were applying what is according to, to them is a good standard of work. Um, but we couldn't blame them. The, the problem is here is the supervisor uh, in ideal case scenario, yes, they can bring um, many more perspectives, uh, but we need to watch it too and sort of to be reasonably humble that uh, our perspective is also limited. <laughs> okay, but now moving on, 
I'm just thinking uh, if the developmental uh, function of supervision becomes that important, what can we do? And that's what I hope that we will open and discuss together. What can we do as supervisors in terms of developing coaching? So, for example, should this function even to be contracted for, although it's officially there, but from my experience, people often deal mainly with normative and restorative function more than developmental. Uh, so, also, how would you feel as a supervisor if someone would say that it is your responsibility as a supervisor to develop a coach? Okay. That's a quite strong statement. Okay. Uh, also, what would we do if the coach only brings the issue of normative or restorative uh, nature to work with. And that's why I put that uh, horse uh, there, which you, <laughs> you can lead it to water, but you can't make it drink. <laughs> so, um, it is some questions to, I will kind of, I hope we will come back to when we start discussing okay, uh, later on. Uh, uh, to, together, but I just want to offer some ideas of what my thinking was in relation to the topic and to, to share with you what we do also in our program in relation to that. And these are for examples of developmental challenges that, from my experience, supervisees actually want to work with specifically if they uh, say. Uh, I appreciate the developmental function of supervision and I don't and I want to develop these particular qualities. So for example, they want to be more confident and you guess probably as supervisors that novices often bring this um, wish. Uh, they want to trust themselves more. Uh, they try to find their own unique model of working, and this is the quite of the typical issues, uh, I would say, and very interesting in my view. Um, they ask, uh, uh, how can I create more space for creative uh, work in addition to effective work? Okay. They uh, actually ask and say, uh, I want to be pushed, I want to experiment with things. Did someone ask something? Right, okay. I thought it was some uh, question. Um, and, and, and you can see on the screen what other questions are, like, um, for example, how can I understand why I'm becoming more stale in my work? That is quite interesting topic that comes through uh, now uh, in quite a few, with quite a few very, very experienced coaches. Uh, to have more answers than questions, uh, to add a spiritual dimension to my work, to see what I can cannot see in my work, to deceive myself less, uh, and even to determine what is my mission in life. Okay, so these are the type of questions that people want to work with. Tatiana, you wrote a whole research article on self-deception. So would you like to talk a couple of minutes about that for people to be more familiar of your work on self-deception? Yeah, I, I think that is, uh, uh, you can see for a very simple reason why um, I bring self-deception again and again, because um, although we are very comfortable sometimes to work exactly like that on a mutual understanding, mutual creation of meaning in our supervision or in our code, uh, and, for example, narrative coaches, they specifically say, uh, what I, I only want to do is to elicit some stories that people can tell me and to help them to redefine those stories. And although I respect those approaches very much, I always say, if we only deal with the stories that people develop, uh, it could be very open to self-deception. We can live in this story. We can think that we are changing or transforming, uh, but very often it doesn't fit with reality. And uh, for that reason, I think self-deception is the quite an important topic. And that's why I um, sometimes uh, I ask people, even in supervision, do you want to contract? Do you want me to um, sort of to raise this question if uh, 
there is a possibility that you deceive yourself in relation to some issues. I don't press it, but I do offer it as an opportunity to work with it. So, um, but uh, there is a paper there on, uh, for, um, so if at the end of the list, you will see that if you want to read uh, the results of my research with coaches, uh, with actually, it, there was the research with supervisors but for coaches. Right, um, now um, I think uh, some people may already be familiar with the developmental stages. I think they could be quite useful in relation to what we are discussing right now, because if it is our function or it is one of our, um, an opportunity to work with development of coaches, uh, then it's important also to help with their development according to where people are, according to what is the most important developmental needs. Even those topics that right now in front of this uh, on the screen for you if you can see some of this topic indicate um, where the person is roughly with their developmental needs and uh, for that reason the stages of development is the relevant topic to discuss right now and what i'm going to offer it, uh, is just a screen where i will show three topics so three stages of development and uh, those people who are very familiar with developmental theories, like Kegans or Cook Grutter or um, Jennifer Berger one, or Torbett, uh, they will see that there is a big difference between this, what I'm going to offer and what they suggest. Because I, uh, with all my respect to those theories, I tend to not to deal with assessment, with the, uh, specific um, instruments or interviews which are developed for assessment. I believe, and that is one of the main preposition in my book, that um, you can identify roughly where the center of gravity uh, uh, is for the person just simply by observing what they want to work with, by observing main developmental themes and challenges they want to bring for their uh, supervision or for their coaching. And what will be in the next screen, it's actually only three stages, because I don't think we need that specific differentiation of uh, seven, eight, or 12 stages. Uh, if the three main themes without instrument, it would be good enough for us to know uh, roughly how to adjust our uh, individual approach to working with the client. Okay. So this is the like introduction to it. Now, uh, these are three groups of developmental themes that I mean. So what um, I call the unformed ego, and I, I won't go into sort of why I call it like that. Let's just simply deal with an essence and won't not spend too much time on, on that. Um, is, um, Imagine a person, and that is important. Just imagine a client, probably easy for now, a coaching client, not the coach for your supervision, just simply a coaching client. And uh, this client uh, brings the topics on a regular basis for your coaching that uh, he, he or she find difficult to make decisions in difficult in situations when lots of people want different things from that person. Okay? Um, uh, sometimes this client will talk about uh, what they are afraid to, talk, to take new role, for example. They feel, oh, I'm not too sure I can manage. So they are afraid to take more responsibilities. Or they say, uh, I have huge problem of work-life balance uh, because I can't say no to all those people who want things from me. And uh, who have also ex explicitly say, um, there are some themes of self-esteem, issues of self-esteem or confidence for them. So uh, can you see this client? Can you imagine that client in principle? Okay. Right. Now imagine a slightly different client. And what I would be uh, um, proposing here, that this client, uh, because with the unformed eager client, they are, could be quite capable of, of everything, but they still are working on the development 
development of the ego that actually capable of making decision and acting independently, uh, not without with help of other people. But the next stage with the form ego, uh, and again, imagine the client who also may talk about lots of stress, okay? but cell uh, that stress this. This stress is typically self-created because they think, okay, I can do this, I can do that, I can do all sorts of things. Uh, and then they take too much on themselves and then feel completely overwhelmed with what they take. Uh, they feel already, okay, I'm reasonably well in what I do, so I want more recognition, I want more promotion, I want more in my life um, in relation to that. Uh, they have more interpersonal conflict sometimes because they can assert the, uh, themselves much better than their unformed ego clients. They uh, typically, if they, they bring for coaching issues of specific problems, they just say, okay, I don't, just let, let me uh, work with what I want to work with. And one of the typical issues, if you work with leaders, uh, they find more difficulties to delegate because they believe that their coping with work better than other people. Okay. So can you see how different the unformed ego client is from the formed ego client? So, and that is uh, the definition of where um, that person is. And now it's a third type of client who actually may also bring issue of sort of dissatisfaction, but their dissatisfaction is on top of what they already can do pretty well. So they may sometimes are perfectly uh, in perfect stage in life, but then they are saying, oh, but I'm still not happy. Uh, they uh, may have not interpersonal conflict or internal conflicts because they feel uh, one part of me wants this, but another part is uh, wants that. And uh, so they search for meaningful, better understanding of who they are and uh, they feel sometimes that they don't fit in the society as it is because there is this sort of rat race everywhere and they are not about that anymore. And uh, sometimes they bring an issue that they change completely the direction of their life. They are in the higher positions, but then they drop this successful work and go and work for themselves, for example. And, uh, but also they notice they deceive themselves and actually say, no, I don't want to deceive myself that much. Or they also ask about things like um, uh, in communication, they don't have problems with communication. It's unformed ego has. But the reformed ego, uh, their problem in relation to communication is not to how to communicate well, but how to stay true to themselves in complex situations. So, can you see this is a very different uh, type of person? Yeah. And that's what I'm proposing. These three themes is possible to identify in anyone, in, a, in, any, in our clients, but also in our coaches that we supervise. And what I'm suggesting now, if you look at these questions and take a couple of minutes, okay, and imagine um, your latest session as a supervisor and think about um, the coach that you worked with using those questions. So what, for example, where do you think that coach is in comparison to these three major uh, columns that I described? Uh, what are the corresponding challenges they face? Uh, how do they judge the quality of the coaching? What do they expect from you as a supervisor? Just uh, take a couple of minutes and imagine a, a concrete person and try to answer this question in relation to you.
Right. Okay, sorry, I can't give you more time, but what I just wanted to share, uh, and I hope uh, what you were thinking about the concrete person, it, it would help to see it in relation to this table. Um, it's also in the paper, you can look at that uh, later, uh, and uh, the paper is in the consulting psychology journal. But uh, here, if you can see, I... Um, put together the same uh, stages but meaning coaches for coach and supervision not the clients so for example if uh, we have a coach with unformed ego so what would be the typical strength is developing confidence in other clients they could be quite good uh, at their work as coaches no problem and will be very helpful uh, for developing confidence in clients. What would be more challenging for them is actually challenging their clients. Um, if they, how they judge the quality of their uh, work, uh, how would the client feel understood and supported? They usually uh, refer to the, um, this as a main criteria of their success. Uh, what they expect from you as a supervisor is also to give more emotional su support to help them to find their style. And what they need to learn in supervision is to believe in themselves. If they deceive, you, it's usually for protection because their ego is not that strong actually to see what they are not seeing at the moment. And, and you can uh, scheme now uh, what are the different ways uh, for supervisors in this case. So, uh, sorry, for coaches with a formed ego. Um, and it's a slightly different way. They um, want their strength is keeping focus on the results. Uh, they more experiment with the process. Uh, so experiment with the process is a bigger challenge for them because they are stuck more with what they can do well. Um, they usually assess the quality of their coaching uh, if the uh, clients achieve their goals. Okay. I, I won't go through all of them because just to save time, um, but you can see uh, what is um, here. And I hope it's, it's a little bit helpful to see uh, where, um, what we can do as supervisors if we differentiate our coaches according to these stages and how we can provide them um, the support, the individual support that they need. Okay, and uh, here I just only added a couple of uh, obstacles to development that I just believe uh, is important for us to know um, and also a couple of questions that um, what is your own attitude to development as a supervisor and what are your own obstacles to development? Okay, and now I'm just uh, happy for us to explore it openly, whatever you want. Great, thank you, Petrina. Do you think you can share these slides with people, particularly the references at the end? Is that okay? Of course, yes. yes. Great. So the people who are interested, I will uh, share that. Just send me an email if you are not in my network, and I will send that to you, please. I will I will write my email here so everybody can help. Uh, mm -hmm. The people that work with me from my program don't don't need to do that. I will just post it for you. But people from CSA or other places who are joining us today, please, um, I will put my email here so everybody can get access to this. So I kind of wanted to bring it back to those questions that I thought. Um, it would be useful for us to explore together uh, uh, because you all um, but if you wanted to talk anything about developmental functions I'm happy to come back to it. I just want to give a quick reaction first of all I really appreciate this and talking it through and I was surprised when I started thinking concretely of the few people that I've supervised so far how they do fit in I'm surprised, mm -hmm. I realized I was surprised because my mm -hmm. assumption was that the supervision would primarily be developmental. And mm -hmm. the degree to which other pe people have um, both veered towards um, 
which one is the first one? The first one is the unformed ego. Um, mm -hmm. that they're more in that stage. I think that they, I expected more along the range of all three as an assumption. And I'm surprised to find more in that first category than I thought I would. Right, okay, yeah. Okay, thank you for, for sharing it, yes. Is that, is that typical? I mean, is, that, is there some kind of percentage or preponderance or of it's, what supervision ends up being? It's a difficult to say, but what, um, uh, and, I, and I wouldn't uh, dare uh, to, to make any, give any percentages because I mostly work with experienced supervisors. But because I supervise also supervisors, it, it comes often from them uh, that uh, particularly with unformed eager coaches, they do deal, for example, very often simply with the su supportive function because they're um, those coaches want really emotional support for them rather than development. Yes. <clears throat> so Tatiana, this is Terry. One of the things I notice when, and this is more with coaching clients um, that are needing development, they usually don't, don't know that, that they're in the middle of this uh, stage shift, but they're usually, mm -hmm. um, uh, usually in a crisis of some kind. You know, like you said, they're either unhappy with their life or things just aren't quite working and it. it's just a general malaise. They don't quite know how to put their finger on it. And that's usually a sign for me that they need, they're in the middle of a stage shift, you know, more, mm -hmm. more of, uh, you know, a la Keegan or, or, mm -hmm. you know, um, so it's that, uh, that's usually when I recommend to them developmental coaching is when I recognize they have a need for it because the, they rarely can point mm -hmm. it out themselves. You know, I think there's a lot of research that says, you know, you, you don't, you can't see the next level when you're in the current level. Uh, so you need a third party to point it out to you often. Um, so I'd like to see what you think about that. If you agree, that that's what Wilbur says, right? That, mm -hmm. you know, you only have visibility, um, you know, mm -hmm. on a root level, existential level at the level you're at. Mm -hmm. um, look, th this is a very good point, And I just want to... Um, uh, to say sort of uh, in what way I differ from uh, this because um, first of all I very rarely actually uh, bring the topic of development uh, uh, kind of say in, indicating it that people desperately need it I just exactly just watch what is their challenge what they want to do with their challenge and uh, if we are talking about the coach right now, that's a slightly different issue because with coaches we do have a responsibility to develop themselves. But if we um, uh, work with simply with clients, you deal with what they bring, okay? And uh, and that's what I would believe the development happens if we actually process whatever the challenge is, whatever the crisis is, okay? I uh, uh, Sometimes people understand a little bit more. They know, for example, about developmental stages, and they said that I want to sort of progress from one stage to another. Uh, but it doesn't happen very often, I agree, because they just simply say, I, I want, um, let's say, to develop myself within to be more confident, or I just want to uh, search for the meaning in my life right now. Uh, that's right, yes. I agree. I have a question for you about that, Tatiana. What is your experience when you're working with uh, supervising supervisors who bring cases in which the um, uh, supervisor is interested in working with uh, on issues that may, um, I'm sorry, when the coach bring to supervision something more around their meaning of their work or the meaning of their life that may mm -hmm. not be completely linked to the, what we talked mm -hmm. about is the job of the supervisor. How, what is your experience on that and how do you put some boundaries around that? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question because uh, what you are suggesting that sometimes people, uh, so how coaching is different from supervision more or less, okay? Mm -hmm. Because you can make, create supervision as simply extra coaching work. And, and uh, I, my view is, okay, 
if it's really connected somehow to the supervisory work, it's fairly justified. Um, but if it becomes simply the only topic of our supervision, uh, then it's probably they need uh, a slightly different contract or maybe not even you, but maybe someone else. So uh, I think it, it has to make, it has relevance to their work. And very often it is. So as long as they can see it. Yeah, because when, one of the points, one of the type, the last topic in the slide of what coaching, uh, of coaching what bring to supervision, it caught my attention that you have that, the last one was about, uh, the yeah. coach wanted to talk about their mission in life. All right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, my reaction was that maybe more for coaching mm -hmm. than for supervision. So that yes, but, uh, can you see sometimes if it is a coach, very often their mission in life is very much connected with how can I help other people to, um, I don't know, reach their potential. <laughs> so it's connected to the work. And uh, that's why they bring it here. Uh, because uh, sometimes, and I had the cases like that, people become coaches uh, only because they feel it is their mission in life. So it's not even, uh, they kind of forget that it's, it's the it's um, they need to earn for <laughs> for life rather than to complete it as a mission. <laughs> yeah, they need to build a business around it. Exactly, yeah. it. So they, <laughs> not to forget that it's also a professional um, activity. It's a business. Yes. We have time for a few more, a couple of more questions. If people are have questions for Tatiana, I think that it's a great opportunity. Do you want to uh, turn off the pay, the? Um, the sh stop sharing the screen so people can see you better. The last two minutes. Oh yeah, so I can remove it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we can see you in a bigger screen. Okay, so anybody have any questions that you would like to ask Tatiana in the last few minutes? I do. I do. Go ahead. It's about that list, Tatiana, um, of um, things that coaches bring to supervision, and I'm curious about that list because okay. I'm wondering if these are their words that they actually state these things that they're coming to you with mm -hmm. or if they were your extrapolation of what they needed in the coaching supervision because um i would really like it if somebody came to me and said i want to deceive myself less but i don't know that they would ever say that <laughs> no it's a good question so when I was putting the list together, of course, it was already my kind of uh, slant on it. I, I didn't skim through the whole <laughs> kind of my reflective notes from all supervision okay. sessions. Yeah. But um, sometimes it's surprising what people can uh, bring. Uh, and uh, I, I actually now started, uh, I keep that note part specifically for those themes uh, since kind of I started working on the presentation because sometimes it's very surprising what they want to work with and, yeah. and very interesting yes yeah thank you anybody else have any questions for Tatiana people are shy today Eva go ahead hi Tatiana thanks it's very interesting and helpful I was not familiar with your work on uh, developmental aspects and what I was wondering here is when we supervise supervisors we're just beginning this and they're pretty self-confident so formed or reformed ego uh, but they're starting what happens in your experience mm. uh, you are saying so we are supervising supervisors supervising supervisors who have built a practice as coaches they have built their self-confidence as coaches, but right. now beginning as supervisors. And then right. self-confidence issues, what happens? Yes. Now, it's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, no, first of all, uh, I want to, uh, probably I didn't make it clear that uh, the stage that I showed, okay, the form that form, they are more like a human development stages. Okay. Because... Uh, in terms of the, our uh, experience, we could be 
also in the very different stages. So it could be, for example, someone uh, highly, um, I don't, okay, further away the line, let's say reform eager, but they could be very beginners as supervisors. That's what you meant. Yeah, yeah that, I, I, I did understand this is stages of life, but uh, I mean, can we fall back? That's my question. Although someone yeah. is reformed or reformed eager already, or even, re, uh, say, questioning mission and adding supervision to the portfolio, I, uh, I want to give back to the profession. But then, yeah. what happens uh, when the per where do you uh, categorize these people when they start starting? When I started, for instance, I remember I had a lot of self-doubt. Right. Uh, can I do this? Will I be good enough? Am I competent? All of these questions, which I think were natural. So mm -hmm. I have to look at them. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's what I'm saying. So the sort of the feeling of uh, kind of, I don't know uh, the, the business, this type of work here. It's a natural feeling. I don't think it's an indication of the stage. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, that's why I would say if there are all sorts of reasons for you to feel that you, you need more experience or you are only building up, uh, that would be absolutely all, all right. So, uh, and, and that's why I'm saying um, it's, and, okay. And it's important things to say um, that probably that's how the stages are slightly different from how uh, Keegan and uh, Torbett and particularly Lasky treat them. I don't actually treat them as a, so, a stages in stone. Okay, if we are there, we are there. I think there is lots of variation between them. Sometimes people actually in work in life, I one more stage in more personal life, a slightly different stage. Sometimes when you are under huge stress you may sort of draw back a little bit sometimes when you start new business you can also start somewhere from the very beginning I'm much more flexible in identifying these things because I believe it's simply an indication of where we are roughly are and what are um, our main challenges but they are still useful because for example, uh, let's imagine that if you are in a reform stage, right, and and there you will, um, you and you started that business, okay? but um, can you imagine your your challenges will be slightly different than someone who on a reform stage and also started the business? Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So uh, it would be much more difficult. There you would simply sort of keep the, um, some themes because it will be e easy for, uh, for kind of for you to understand, to appreciate it, to take more perspectives on that. And, and then you would probably feel much more comfortable sooner than the informed eager. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, so uh, in other words, um, a few behaviors may fall back, but we're looking to the overall stage and understanding that these are natural behaviors, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That they're not the stage. Is that yeah. it? Okay. Yes, I, exactly. Because sometimes people even use that word, there is a center of gravity, okay? But, uh, and that what we trust to, you, you can't intuitively even decide it because it, they are not in stones, okay? They are only helpful clues. And sometimes, actually, you may be mistaken. And, mm, I, I think nothing wrong with that, and it's good, it's, it's great to have a surprise, <laughs> and so whatever direction it is, because uh, it's good to be challenged in relation to that. What is the most important is still to help the person to deal whatever they bring, okay, and that was developmental in itself, if you uh, deal with that. So, Tatiana, I want to I thank you very much, Eva, for your question. We need to wrap up. We are at the top of the hour, so people have other commitment. But, Tatiana, I want to thank you in the name of everybody here today for your commitment, for your support, uh, for making this happen today. I think we all learned a lot from you. And uh, we want to, before we go, uh, is there anything, Tatiana, you want to say to say goodbye and I have a brief announcement before everybody goes uh, about what happened next month? In, any last words, Tatiana, that you want to share with people before you go? I oh, know, I just want to thank you for your quick.
patience and it was lovely to connect with you. And I'm in October, um, no, yes, October. I'm in Boston, so I hope some of you will be at the Harvard conference or I will be able to see you. And for the people who are going to the conference, it will be great. And Lily had a couple of announcements about our guest for next month and the conference that we're organizing for next year. Hi, everybody. Uh, so our next call is on August 14th, um, 8 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, David Clutterbuck will be with us. <coughs> so that's the next um, of this group. And then uh, I'm working with uh, Damien. We're working on a... Well, Peter Hawkins will be in Victoria April 16th to 18th, 2018, to do his systemic team coaching course. It's a three-day course. If anyone wants to be on the list, send me an email. And then April 19th, Hawkins will stay and do a one full day of deep dive on the seven-eyed model, as well as his clear model of supervision. And that's for uh, targeted at supervisors specifically. And then the 19th, the following day, would be the, our coaching supervision uh, day in Victoria as well. So that's all in the works uh, to, be, to be announced. So if you're interested, uh, just pop me an email. Yeah. And thanks, Tatiana. And okay. um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And for people who are part of my networks, I will send you the slides. Tatiana, you can send it to me. For people who are not, please, will you send me an email? So I will be happy to forward the presentation and also a link uh, of this session for people who came late. I think a few people came late, so you can listen to the first part of the session. So thanks, everybody. Good seeing you. Thank you, Damian. See you later. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.